Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the Constitutional Studies Program. As I hope most of you know, all of you know, that we have a minor in Constitutional Studies uh, here at Notre Dame. Uh, we have some information uh, on the tables uh, for all you students who might be interested in the minor. Uh, constitutional Studies includes things like constitutional law, but it's really about the principles of a free and just society. Uh, and we um, have a gateway seminar, which I teach. I'm teaching right now. I think I'll be teaching uh, it next semester as well. So if you're interested in the minor, please come talk to me or uh, many of the students in this room are Constitutional Studies minors. Uh, one of the things we do at the minor is uh, we have uh, a fellows program. Uh, about 10 undergraduates serve as our fellows, our Tocqueville fellows every year. The Tocqueville fellows um, help us organize events, come up with their own events. They uh, have a seminar with our speakers or, and our visiting guests, and they help us uh, uh, introduce our speakers as well. Uh, so towards that end, I'm going to introduce Michael Moss. Michael is a senior from Minnesota, political science and philosophy major, and uh, he just told me, or maybe I just told him he's going to minor in constitutional studies as well, and Michael will introduce our speaker. As Professor Munoz said, I'm Michael Moss, and yeah, I've seen you here studying political science and philosophy and still not constitutional studies. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I am fortunate to participate in the Tocqueville program for inquiry into religion and public life this year, uh, which is hosting this program along with the uh, Potenciani program for in constitutional studies. It is my pleasure today to introduce today's speaker. Stephen Knott is a professor of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College. Prior to this position, he was co-chair of the presidential oral history program at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia and personally directed the Ronald Reagan Oral History Project. His books include Alexander Hamilton and the Persistence of Myth, uh, Secret and Sanctioned Covert Operations and the American Presidency, and Rush to Judgment, George W. Bush, The War on Terror, and His Critics. His most recent book, Washington and Hamilton, The Alliance That Forged America, was published in September of last year and is co-authored with Tony Williams. Through the book, Nod and Williams explore the unique relations between these two exceptional men. The one, a statesman and general, propelled to leadership of a young country. The other, America's original rags to riches success story. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nod. Thank you, all of you. It really is a delight to be here. This is my first visit to Notre Dame. so. It's quite a thrill, and I want to thank Michael for that very kind introduction, and also my good friend Sue Collins and Philip Munoz, who arranged this event, and Jen Smith, who handled all the tactical and logistical matters related to it. What I'd like to talk to you about today is what I consider to be the most important collaboration of the American founding. Unfortunately, this collaboration tends to be slighted, even to this day, to some extent, in terms of a focus on Thomas Jefferson and his relationship with James Madison, or perhaps Jefferson and his relationship with John Adams. That tends to be, at least in terms of founding collaboration relationships, that tends to be where historians focus their attention. And I believe this is done partly for ideological reasons, which I'll get into later if you wish. So this extraordinary alliance between Washington and Hamilton uh, was truly unusual in that Washington was a very wealthy Virginia planter, and Hamilton was, in fact, a very brash immigrant from the Caribbean who came from a completely dysfunctional background. So you really could not have found two more different personalities who somehow ended up collaborating with one another and creating the American regime. And these men, Washington and Hamilton, fought for the better part of 22 years to win independence and to prove, as Hamilton put it in the Federalist Papers, that societies of men are really capable of establishing good government from reflection and choice. 
So again, this was a remarkably unusual alliance. And despite their differences, Washington and Hamilton shared a lot of common ground. They collaboratively pursued their vision of a continental republic throughout the Revolutionary War and through the founding of the nation. Uh, they were subject to intense criticism, particularly during the Washington presidency, because their wartime experiences, and this is crucial, their wartime experiences set them apart from many of their founding brethren, some of whom developed, I would contend, an abstract armchair radicalism dangerously divorced from the cold reality of revolutionary death and destruction. Washington and Hamilton saw death up close and pers personal multiple times throughout the revolution. And in fact, Washington himself had had a number of horses shot out from under him. He could have easily been killed at a number of points during the Revolutionary War. And this led both of them to understand that there was a thin veneer separating order from chaos. And it led them to embrace the virtues of moderation and to revere stability. So they were sober revolutionaries, and thankfully so, for due to them, the American Revolution did not consume itself, uh, unlike most modern revolution, revolutions. The American Revolution was a close call in terms of escaping this fate, but because of Washington and Hamilton and other Federalists primarily, I would argue, we did escape that fate. So it was war that brought George Washington and Alexander Hamilton together. And it was war that forged the principles and practices that would animate their entire public careers, including, as I've mentioned, their aversion to revolutionary violence. Needless to say, and I don't think I need to say this, but I guess I will say it, both men were deeply committed to the American Revolution, but they were not as committed, in a sense, as their somewhat zealous compatriots such as Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson. Both Paine and Jefferson's theoretical musings veer dangerously close to the revolutionaries of modern times who profess a kind of abstract love for humanity, frequently from the confines of a cloistered library, and who envision mankind freed from the strictures of the past and reaching new levels of perfectibility. Washington and Hamilton never suffered from any of these illusions, and in fact, they were convinced of the flawed nature of man, and both men stood firmly for reason over passion and for stability over speculative change. Alexander Hamilton first demonstrated this commitment to these principles when he was a 20-year-old student at King's College, now Columbia University, when an angry revolutionary mob stormed the house of the college president, Miles Cooper, who was a Tory sympathizer. Hamilton appealed for calm long enough to allow the frightened president to escape through a back door. This would be the first of many Hamiltonian appeals for reason over passion, a position to which he would hear throughout his entire public life. In many ways, what happened on the steps of that president's house epitomized Hamilton's conception of statesmanship, preserving order and holding the forces of passion at bay for as long as possible. Neither Washington nor Hamilton shared the growing belief within the ranks of the Jeffersonians that the people always reasoned correctly and that the cure-all for the problems of a republic was more democracy. This also explains, by the way, some of the hostility towards Hamilton and to a lesser extent towards Washington that one finds in progressive circles to this day. Hamilton's candor regarding the failings of public opinion stands in stark contrast to Thomas Jefferson's feel-good rhetoric. And of course, Jefferson wrote more frequently about the wisdom of the American people, though it should be noted in a nod of his private correspondence there are exceptions to this rosy rhetoric that tend to be selectively ignored by populist historians. Uh, many of these same scholars are inclined to see Hamilton's skeptical attitude toward public opinion as evidence that he was a closet authoritarian 
or something worse. As offensive as Hamilton's position may seem to modern sensibilities, he believed, rightly so, I would argue, that the public, that the public sometimes errs, and that while the people intend to do right by the common good, they do not always reason right about the means of promoting it. And Hamilton believed this was partly due to the ability of demagogues to flatter the people, uh, which presented a constant threat in a republic. By appealing to public prejudices, demagogues were able to lead the people to betray their true interests. Again, both Washington and Hamilton rejected this approach, and they were aware that the forces of populism at work in their day were prone to respond to, as Hamilton put it in the Federalist Papers, every sudden breeze of passion and every temporary delusion. And this, of course, is completely at odds with the permanent long-term interests of the nation. Hamilton and Washington believed that the deliberate sense of the community should govern and that this was possible only through a government that allowed for cool and sedate reflection. There would be times when statesmanship would require the president to resist the wishes of, its, of the people. At its core, this is what Washington and Hamilton's federalism was all about, and it was this that was slowly but surely undone by the Jeffersonian and Jacksonian movements of the first half of the 19th century and whose task was completed by the progressive movement of the early 20th century. Nowhere were the conflicting visions of Washington and Hamilton's federalism and Jefferson's republicanism more pronounced than in their differing views on the French Revolution. Jefferson was far more comfortable, and as I've mentioned, far more comfortable with the notion of revolutionary violence than either Hamilton or Washington, to the point of endorsing the idea that if the French revolutionaries killed every man and woman in France, save one each to keep the species alive, it would be worth it. A little revolution now and then was a good thing, Jefferson believed, and served in the political order to refresh the order of things just as storms and wildfires serve a positive function in the natural world. In fact, Jefferson believed that the American Constitution should be revised every generation, as it was unjust for the dead to govern the living. Washington and Hamilton, who I've said repeatedly already, had personally experienced the impact of revolutionary violence were far less taken with juvenile notions of the positive effect of bloodshed and upheaval. Hamilton had come from a Caribbean environment rife with lawlessness and simmering violence, and his family upbringing was marked by instability and dislocation. In contrast, Thomas Jefferson's early, earliest memory, which he later recounted as an adult, was a recollection of being carried on a pillow by a slave. Hamilton was shaped by the fragility of life and the constant struggle for mere survival, Jefferson by the infinite possibilities of a carefree life built on the toil of others. Hamilton was also repulsed with the ease by which the French revolutionaries and their American supporters countenance violence as a means of purging elements of the old order. In Hamilton's view, there was no common ground between the American and French revolutions. The former was characterized by a devotion to liberty, the latter by a passion for licentiousness. The American Revolution was, in Hamilton's view, a revolution of sober expectations, to borrow a term coined two centuries later, while the French Revolution anticipated the totalitarian upheavals of the 20th century with their mass executions and their propensity to turn on themselves with unbridled ferocity. Hamilton, like Washington and almost all Americans, had initially welcomed the events in France. And in fact, Hamilton and President Washington were both granted the title of honorary French citizenship by the revolutionary government in September 1791. But by the fall of 1792, 
after the murder of 1,400, quote, counter-revolutionaries, end quote, many Americans began to turn against the revolution, including Washington and Hamilton. There was nothing comparable, Hamilton correctly observed in May 1793, between the bloodletting in France and what had occurred in the United States. Hamilton was especially appalled at Jefferson's support for the French Revolution, even when it deteriorated into a bloodbath. However, he took some solace in the fact that if virtue had any meaning in the affairs of men, the day would come when advocacy for the French Revolution in its late stages would be seen, in Hamilton's words, as a disgrace. Washington feared that the French Revolution would veer to the dark side almost from the start, and he warned the Marquis de Lafayette, or simply Lafayette, as he was known in the new revolutionary order, quote, against running into extremes and prejudicing your cause. He was, as Ron Chernow, Hamilton's biogra biographer, observes, Washington was astonishingly, astonishingly prophetic about the descent into violence that the revolution would follow, although remaining publicly supportive for as long as possible. But again, as I mentioned, Jefferson remained committed to the French revolutionary cause even after it turned into a Napoleonic dictatorship. And he continued to believe that the bloodletting in France was a necessity, despite the fact that 85% of the victims of the various purges in France were commoners. By the way, the total body count of the French Revolution was at least, at a minimum, 17,000 victims. With his administration split over both domestic and foreign policy, President Washington pleaded with Hamilton and Jefferson to halt the combat that was taking place openly on the pages of the nation's cap of the newspapers in the nation's capital in Philadelphia. Hamilton's essays were written under a pseudonym, while Jefferson, true to form, relied on surrogates, including James Madison and James Monroe, to attack Hamilton. By the way, if it's not clear to you yet, I have to confess that I suffer from a form of Jefferson derangement syndrome. So if any of you are kind of leaning in that direction, you can take, you can venture a spleen when we get to the questions. Um, Madison claimed at Jefferson's behest in one piece that Hamilton and his supporters wanted to conduct government by, quote, the terror of military force. Matters came to a head in October 1793 at a breakfast between Washington, George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson that was hosted at Mount Vernon. When Jefferson began outlining Hamilton's plot to transform this government, the American government, into a monarchy, Washington dismissed the accusations out of hand, claiming that there were not 10 men in the United States whose opinions were worth attention to who entertained such a thought. In the aftermath of this contentious breakfast, Jefferson concluded that George Washington's mind, which had been long used to unlimited applause, was incapable of accepting information of a challenging nature. In Jefferson's view, Washington was an aging president with a closed mind who was being manipulated by Hamilton and was showing a willingness to let others act and even think for him, as Jefferson put it. This notion of a somewhat slow-witted President Washington being manipulated by a Svengali-like advisor is, of course, ludicrous on its face. No one, Hamilton included, would ever describe Washington as a wallflower or somebody who could easily be pushed around. No one would also never describe, ever describe Washington as an avid reader or a closet philosopher. But Hamilton respected Washington's judgment and never condescended to the president as Jefferson now did. Meanwhile, the constant combat that dogged Washington's at least the first five years of his eight years in the presidency continued unabated. One of the, um, oh, this is pretty, it's impressive. <laughs> One of the, uh, there's, there's sort of a conventional wisdom out there that the confrontation 
uh, the key confrontation of the founding era was between Jefferson on one side and Hamilton on the other, when in fact, I argue in my book and elsewhere, that the confrontation was in fact between Washington and Hamilton on one side and Jefferson and Madison on the other. And Thomas Jefferson helped to foster this myth, celebrating his man-to-man -man confrontation with Hamilton by placing busts of Hamilton and himself, and if any of you have been to Monticello, you've seen this, uh, facing each other in the entrance to his beautiful home outside of Charlottesville. Um, when startled visitors would inquire as to why he would display a bust of his arch enemy, Alexander Hamilton, directly across from himself, Jefferson would dryly note, opposed in death as in life. Over time, some Jeffersonians came to see Washington less as a victim of Hamilton's machinations and more as a co-conspirator. This was an accurate assessment of the situation. Hamilton remained firmly under the President's direction throughout the over five years he served as Secretary of the Treasury. Jefferson himself would later testify to Washington's hands-on control of his presidency. Both in their time and in ours, Jefferson, Madison, and their admirers have had to choose between two unflattering options regarding the father of our country, George Washington. Again, as I noted, he could either be seen as a puppet of the cunning bastard, as John Adams called him, from the Caribbean, or a willing accomplice to Hamilton's nefarious plots. Uh, to massage their consciences or to minimize the political repercussions, Many Jeffersonians and their ideological heirs adopted a similar position that an elder, elderly, doddering, intellectually challenged George Washington was unaware of the plotting that was taking place uh, within his executive household. As early as the summer of 1790, populist demagogues such as Senator William McClay of Pennsylvania were claiming in private that Washington was being manipulated by Hamilton and basically served the sole purpose of cleaning up or wiping away the blame of any criticism of Hamilton. These slanders are all the more galling since unlike Washington or Jefferson or Madison, and, and by the way, what I should clarify here is that Hamilton was seen as a tool of the wealthy. He was seen as a tool of the bankers. Um, he was considered by many to be sort of the founding plutocrat um, and, and yet, while serving as Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton had severed all outside sources of income while in office, something that the, his contemporaries, including Washington, Jefferson, and Madison, failed to do. To this day, critics of the Federalists tend to focus their fire exclusively on Hamilton so as to avoid the blowback that would accrue from attacking Washington. But again, uh, Hamilton's policies were very much those of President Washington. Remarkably, these facts continued to be ignored, the fact that Washington was actually in charge of his presence, not Alexander Hamilton. And it still is true that attacking Hamilton was and is a far more palatable approach than attacking the towering figure of George Washington. Um, but to the bitter end, to the very end of Washington's life, he rallied to Hamilton's defense. He dismissed these accusations that Hamilton had undermined him. And in fact, uh, by the end of Washington's life, the last four years of his life, he had no contact whatsoever with Thomas Jefferson. He literally he cut him up. Uh, this was the result of a letter being published that Jefferson had written to a friend uh, which Jefferson had referred to Washington as a whore for Great Britain. Imagine how that must have felt, uh, having led the revolutionary effort against the British. Um, I can't let this moment pass without talking a little bit about Hamilton's refurbished reputation in the American mind. He's now become something of a Broadway legend. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the musical in New York. I, was fortunate enough to see it. And there's no doubt that this musical saved Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill, which he would have been removed. 
Um, but while it's important to note that while Hamilton is at least currently seen as something of an heroic figure, an immigrant rags to riches story, throughout much of the nation's history, he was seen as somehow un-American, a closet monarchist who, who hated the people whom he supposedly referred to as a great beast which is something he never said, but it's been attributed to him regularly, and a man whose dictatorial ambitions were checked by the champion of the common man, Thomas Jefferson. And part of the reason for this, these myths about Hamilton, part of the reasons they persisted, is that Jefferson and his lieutenants uh, outlived Hamilton. Hamilton is killed in 1804 in the duel with Aaron Burr. Jefferson outlives him by 22 years. Adams outlives him by 22 years. Both of those men strongly disliked Hamilton. They used that 22-year period to sort of influence uh, the historiography of the founding era. I've often referred to Hamilton as one of the first victims of the politics of personal destruction. Uh, Jefferson believed that, as I said, Hamilton uh, favored a monarchy, but not only a monarchy, but a monarchy, as Jefferson put it, botted, bottomed or rooted in corruption. And he believed that Hamilton had betrayed the spirit of 1776. So Hamilton was, for the Jeffersonians, seen as a British agent. And as mentioned, this cunning immigrant had uh, manipulated this somewhat dim-witted President George Washington. George Washington. Jefferson's heirs in the Democratic Party, particularly Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren, echoed Jefferson's caricatured conception of Hamilton. But the Civil War and the rise of the anti-slavery Republican Party, and by the way, Hamilton was anti-slavery, um, provided a brief respite from this populist Hamilton bashing. A series of Republican presidents, including James Garfield, Rutherford B. Hayes, Benjamin Harrison, all deeply admired Hamilton for his nationalism and to some extent for his anti-slavery stance, which stood in stark contrast to the largest slave owner, one of the largest slave owners of Virginia, Jefferson and his neo-secessionism. Hamilton's reputation peaked at the dawn of the 20th century when Republicans such as Theodore Roosevelt invoked Hamilton's nationalism and his embrace of an energetic government to provide a kind of founding imprimatur for their progressive agenda. One of Roosevelt's less than progressive successors, Warren G. Harding, revered Hamilton, and he and his Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon, erected a statue of Hamilton that stands to this day outside the Treasury Department. But Harding and Mellon's embrace of Hamilton was guaranteed, and remains guaranteed, to offend uh, progressives and populists. And when the Great Depression came, Hamilton was held almost as culpable as Andrew Mellon and Herbert Hoover. Other than Thomas Jefferson, no American contributed more to Hamilton's negative image in the American mind than Franklin D. Roosevelt. The only book review that FDR ever wrote was of Claude Bauer's Jefferson and Hamilton, The Struggle for Democracy in America. Uh, I consider it to be a pretty sophomoric account of Jefferson's uh, sort of heroic resistance to Hamilton's plutocratic plotting. But FDR loved the book and would go on to present the same caricatured account of Hamilton in many speeches and letters. It was Franklin Roosevelt who elevated Thomas Jefferson into the American pantheon, along with Washington and Lincoln. And it was Roosevelt who led the drive to erect the beautiful Tidal Basin Memorial to Jefferson in Washington, DC. Hamilton's reputation during the Second World War sank so low that he was seen by many as Joseph Goebbels in a waistcoat and breeches. I thought that would generate something, but I guess not. Uh, his defenders were compelled to argue that Hamilton would, in fact, have opposed the Nazis. At the height of the war, one of the leading Broadway shows was called The Patriots, and the plot of this show, multiple award-winning show, it was the Hamilton of its day, uh, revolved around a cigar-chomping Hamilton, stomping around the stage, all the while proclaiming that the American people were, quote, quote drunken swine, end quote. 
Franklin Roosevelt invited the playwright to stage a command performance in Washington and to attend the dedication of the Jefferson Memorial. This image of Hamilton as the plum plundering plutocrat with mon monarchical inclinations held well into the 20th century, but began to break down partly in response to Hamilton's status as the sole immigrant among the founding fathers, the key founding fathers. Uh, this status, I believe, this status of uh, Hamilton's immigrant status will likely secure his reputation in an increasingly diverse America. Hamilton's standing has also improved due to increased scholarly appreciation of the role of race in American society. As I mentioned, Jefferson's role as one of the largest slave owners in Virginia stands in stark contrast to Hamilton's founding membership in the New York Society for the Manumission of Slaves. And fair or not, it appears to be an iron law in American history that as one falls, the other rises. So I, let me just conclude before we get to some questions. Uh, it is my hope, it was my hope with this book and some of the other work that I've done that Americans will sort of put aside this caricatured account of their early history, which pits the supposed champions of the people, Jefferson, Madison, and their party, against the forces of privilege and authoritarianism, Hamilton, Washington, and the Federalists. And if the American people do so, they will discover that due to the exertions of George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, the American people began to think continentally as Hamilton put it, and created a strong union which decades and then centuries later helped to defeat fascism and communism, explored the universe, produced endless scientific and technological breakthroughs, and perhaps more importantly, or most importantly, abolished slavery and Jim Crow, thereby securing the blessings of liberty for all of their fellow citizens. Thank you. like a little good Jefferson bashing. Uh, um, we have a tradition here uh, at the program, which is we always invite our undergraduate students uh, to ask the first question. So any undergraduates uh, with a question? And do me a favor, stand up and uh, speak loudly, and also tell us uh, your name and where you are at Notre Dame. Okay, sure. My name is Andrew. I'm a freshman in political science. And thank you for your sure. intriguing use of puns along the way. Uh, <laughs> My question is regarding to the debate over the view of American populism and people's will between Jefferson and Hamilton. In this lecture, we see a lot of allegations of demagoguery and populism and debates over what the American people truly want and whether we should listen to them. Do you see any parallels in this discussion to the debate between Jefferson and Hamilton about what is the beast of the American people's will? Do you think there's any lessons we can draw on how to deal with the American people's supposedly populist urges? Oh, Summarize the question. Yeah, yeah. Well, so essentially the question is about the, the uh, ongoing presence of sort of demagoguery and populism and the differences between Jefferson and Hamilton on that problem and any lessons for today. Is that a fair summary? Okay. Uh, there's no question that Hamilton was far more skeptical about pub the public reasoning right and far more fearful about uh, the potential for a demagogue sort of riding in on a white horse and telling the American public that he was going to solve all their problems and then sort of once achieving power, you know, shutting the system down, essentially. Uh, Jefferson, I think, did have far more confidence in the public. He thought they would reason right. Uh, that's part of the reason why he wanted to decentralize power, keep it closer to the people. Uh, in some ways, even though he didn't admire a lot of New England, he admired the New England town meeting, which was st is still in use. Um, so, uh, and Hamilton, again, repeatedly warns of demagogue, demagogue, demagogue. And in fact, Hamilton came to see Jefferson as one of those demagogues. Um, I mean, I, are you asking me to sort of comment on this 2016 presidential? I think they'd both be horrified, to be blunt. 
Um, but the, a lot more would horrify them beyond just the fact that it's Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Uh, they would see the whole uh, presidential selection process as having been completely democratized, and even Jefferson, I think, would find that sort of appalling. Um, I don't recall Jefferson's stance on the Electoral College, but most of the founders were actually thrilled. They thought the Electoral College was one of their greatest achievements. Uh, that it would serve as a filter between public opinion and selecting the person for the most important office in the land. So one of the things that would appall them would be the fact that the Electoral College has pretty much just become a rubber stamp for, pub, uh, for the popular vote. So that would upset them. Again, it's got nothing to do with Trump or Clinton. It's just that we've, we've uh, due to the reforms put in place by the progressives who kind of built on Jefferson and Jackson's legacies, uh, we've turned the, the presidency into very much a creature of public opinion, and that, that would appall them, appall both of them. So I realize that was sort of a meandering answer, but good question. Another question uh, from an undergraduate, please. So you talked about in the beginning about- tell us, your, tell us your name. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm Michaela. I'm a senior. Um, I'm a, in the program of liberal studies, not uh, political science, but um, you talked about in the beginning about Hamilton's kind of negative view of humanity. And I was wondering if you could talk about the tension of that and um, also a democracy, because very famously Hobbes has a negative view of humanity and it's more of a despotic kind of government. And you have Montesquieu who thinks humanity can do good, can reason, and all of that, and right. has a democracy. Yeah, so Hamilton's negative view of, of uh of the people or you know, of democracy, and you know, that's problematic for a republic. Um, yeah, uh, let me, uh, you, didn't, you would not have gotten any of this, what I'm about to say from my pre previous remarks. Hamilton did believe that people like himself and others who had liter literally risen out of nothing uh, were capable of doing great things. So there were, there were, and he would have used, he would have said men, there were men who were capable of the highest form of, of ambition and who would be pursuing um, an, an honorable, they would be attempting, they would enter the public arena with high intentions, with noble intentions. And he would have saw himself, he would have saw, would have seen George Washington in the same light. Um, so even a Hamilton who comes out of nowhere is capable of rising. And in a way, I believe Hamilton tries to create an economic system that allows people to rise. That's a separate. Um, so he was not a champion of democracy. None of the founders were, with the possible exception of Thomas Paine. Jefferson's closer to that, but even Jefferson understands that there has to be some filtering of public sentiment. And Jefferson praised the American Constitution as an incredible achievement. The only objection he had to the Constitution, he's over in Paris when the Constitution is, is written. The only objection he had was there were no term limits paid, placed on the presidency. Other than that, he said he thought it was terrific. So we can't go too far with this idea that Hamilton was contemptuous of the people and therefore quite tried to create a, a government that would keep public opinion. I mean, Jefferson seemed to agree with the Constitution as well. So, um, yeah, it's just important to remember that Hamilton believed in Republican government. He believed in an economic system that allow, would allow people to rise like himself, it would allow the ambitious and the best and the brightest to rise. So in that sense, he's not, he's not, he's not an authoritarian. He's not trying to, and he was, he was very much opposed to the idea of any sort of American aristocracy. He was frequently accused of wanting to do such a thing, of create an American aristocracy, and he would bitterly push back, strongly push back against that notion. If he had any conception of an aristocracy, it was an aristocracy of the best and the brightest. Is that anti-democratic? Yeah, I'll leave that up to you. Let's, op let's open it up to anyone who'd like a question, and uh, please stand and identify yourself, please. My name is Gilberto. I have a question regarding the election of 1800. Sure. So as we know, uh, Alexander Hamilton like, 
through his support behind Jefferson, his arch enemy, his uh, like of all his work, he, like, like they hated each other, they had opposite views on basically everything. Yet he threw his support behind him over Aaron Burr. What did he see in Burr that said, "I prefer Thomas Jefferson"? Yeah, great question. So what did what did Hamilton see in Burr that led him to support his arch rival Jefferson uh, for president in 1800? And by the way, Hamilton's support for Jefferson in 1800 arguably allowed Jefferson to secure the presidency. The, Pope, the vote had there'd been an electoral college tie in 1800 between Jefferson and Burr. Um, and it got thrown into the House of Representatives, which is what the Constitution requires. God willing, we won't see that in the near future. Um, and uh, it took 36 ballots to, for Jefferson to win the presidency, in partly due to Hamilton's intervention on behalf of Jefferson. And he flat out says in a letter he wrote to one of the Federalist members of Congress, if there's a man I should hate, it's Thomas Jefferson. But, he said Jefferson actually has some principles and that Jefferson would defend the office of the presidency, having seen him in these cabinet meetings with President Washington. He knew that Jefferson was a defender of executive prerogatives. And so, for those reasons, he urged his fellow Federalists to vote for uh, Jefferson over Burr. What he saw in Burr, and by the way, almost every major American founding father that you can think of saw the same thing in Burr. That this was a guy who would put his finger in the wind to see which way the wind was blowing and act accordingly. And Hamilton put it more than once, the man had no guiding principles. He was, in a sense, a creature of public opinion. He was a slave to public opinion. And Jefferson felt this way. Washington felt this way about Burr. Madison felt this way about Burr. Monroe felt this way, and Hamilton. Those guys didn't agree on anything else except that Aaron Burr was completely unprincipled and should never get anywhere near the presence. I'm getting a little fired up here because there's an attempt, <laughs> there's an attempt uh, in the last few years to rehabilitate Aaron Burr as some sort of uh, guy, man, well, in a way he was ahead of his time, not in a good way, um, <laughs> but as some sort of civil rights advocate, and uh, some have even described him as, as the founding feminist, which is kind of amazing if you know anything about his personal life, which we don't need to get into. Um, just, just a real damaged character. And he showed his true character after he kills Hamilton in the duel. By the way, Hamilton throws his shot away. Burr's shot goes into Hamilton's body. That says something about the two men. After that, he flees west to create his own little empire, you know, Burrville or whatever he's going to call it, and, uh, which would have included this part of the country. Um, and Jefferson has him brought back and tried for treason. He's acquitted, but I mean, he was guilty as hell. So, if I can be so, um, he is not a man worthy of anyone's respect. I suppose this means we shouldn't name the program after Aaron Burr, but uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Hi, my name is Rob Wiley, political science. Can you put a, uh, Hamilton, I know, in Federalist 84, uh, is a bit dim on the Bill of Rights. Uh, and that's a complex part of his legacy, so could you right. contextualize that? Sure. Me? Yeah, Hamilton's opposition to, to the Bill of Rights, although he came around to thinking, well, if this is what it takes to get the Constitution ratified, so be it. Um, by the way, Madison had the same, Madison objected to the Bill of Rights initially. He did not think it was necessary. Both Hamilton and Madison believed that due to separation of powers and checks and balances, you had a Bill of Rights. You know, the federal government was not going to be able to uh, oppress the people, um, that the government would be checked from within, and that you didn't need this parchment document that lists certain protected rights. I mean, part of Hamilton's objections to the Bill of Rights is, you know, you, you may leave things off that are actually pretty important. You know, how are you going to come up with a complete and perfect specification of every right that's worthy of protection. So if you list some and neglect others, there's that problem. I'm not sure how much he believed that. Uh, that may have just been for sort of uh, consumption, public consumption at the time. But the bottom line for Hamilton was that the way the original Constitution was drawn up, there was simply no way 
that the federal government would be in position to trample on the rights of the people. But you're right, that is, a, that is a, one of the, if there's a sort of bill of indictment, a list of, uh, of criticisms of, of Hamilton that's frequently mentioned, his, his opposition to the Bill of Rights. But again, you know, people forget that Madison was opposed to it as well. So. Okay, maybe one or, one or two more. Yes, I can. Hi, my name is Matthew. I'm a sophomore political science major, and uh, my question is related more to the idea you were talking about that, like Jefferson saw Washington as more of a puppet of Hamilton. And whatnot. Right. But what do you think Jefferson's uh, reaction would have been to Washington kind of suddenly deciding to leave the executive office after eight years? Because I, I, I don't think there was any indication ahead of time or that Hamilton would have known or supposedly like. What do I want to, what do I want to say? Like manipulated him toward that, like Jefferson might have probably suggested. That, that Washington leave? Yeah. After eight? yeah, like maybe Jefferson, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, what would Jefferson have thought? Because surely he couldn't think that Hamilton would convince him to do that. He, well, uh, okay, so the, uh, as the election of 1796 approaches, this this quite, Washington could have run for a third term. Hamilton actually tried to persuade him to run for a third term. Um, so in Hamilton's view, it would be best if Washington stayed put. I, Washington was just, I'll give you a you know, real heavy-duty political science expression, burned out. He was burned out by 1796. He wanted to go back to Mount Vernon. He had wanted to go back to Mount Vernon in 1792. Um, he didn't want to run for a second term. So uh, Hamilton tries to persuade him to stick around for a third term, partly because Hamilton has no confidence in John Adams, who was the vice president and who was sort of the leading, seen as the leading Federalist contender. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm addressing your question because I'm, I'm still not sure what your question was, no offense, but. Uh, Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. I see. How could Jefferson see Washington as a, pu a puppet even late in the game like this when Hamilton's trying to persuade him to stay and Washington says, no, I'm going. Um, look, I can't, I, it's beyond me how Jefferson could ever see Washington as a puppet of anybody, whether it's, you know, Alexander Hamilton or Martha Washington or whoever. Uh, I mean, George Washington was, again, he wasn't, I don't think he was smarter than Hamilton or Jefferson or Madison, but he was, uh, I think he had more what we might call today emotional intelligence, certainly than Hamilton did, um, and he had proven himself to be his own man throughout his life. Hamilton had been his staff officer during the Revolutionary War, and you're going to tell me that 15 years later this staff officer is controlling the commander in chief. It's it's ludicrous on the face of it. So I, I just I can't I can't give you a, a nice answer. I I don't know how Jefferson could believe that, and which is why I suggested in my talk that I think it was partly for political consumption. They just could not bring themselves to admit that George Washington was in league with, thought the same way, had the same world view as Alexander Hamilton. That was too much for them to countenance. So they, come, they came up with this manipulative story of an aging president. Aging, by the way, at the age of you know, 62, which is kind of chilling for someone like me. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me get the last question in, which is, uh, does, is the Constitution ratified without the presence of George Washington a, at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, and B, is it true that everyone expected him to be the first president? Yeah, I, <clears throat> so, I argue in the book, we argue, excuse me, the co-author and I argue that without George Washington, there's no success in the Revolutionary War. Not that he was a great general, he wasn't, but he was persistent and resilient. And uh, also that the Constitutional Convention without Washington presiding over that convention, and without Washington lending his name to that convention, I don't think it gets ratified. Of course, you know, we're speculating here, we're engaging in a little counterfactual 
uh, history, but um, he is the indispensable man. He's indispensable for victory in the revolution. He's indispensable for keeping the proceedings, not that he was an active participant in the Constitutional Convention, uh, but his mere presence in the chair forced everybody to behave, led everybody to behave. And the fact that then when it went out for ratification, the people knew that this one national figure, this is, this is the only American known from Georgia to New Hampshire, okay? There's no one else, maybe Ben Franklin, but Ben Franklin was in his 80s. So Washington is the lone national figure who lends a kind of legitimacy to the whole constitutional endeavor. And again, without him, and also, as you asked, Philip, I mean, there was this assumption that he would be the first president, and that did make certainly the Article II provisions dealing with the presidency more pal palatable to some of the delegates at the convention, but also to those voters in the ratifying conventions in the various states. So he is the indispensable man. As much as I had to say about Hamilton today, I kind of perhaps slighted Washington a little bit. But again, without George Washington, None of this happens. Uh, without George Washington, Alexander Hamilton is probably a lawyer practicing law in Manhattan, and nobody knows who he is. And Hamilton, by the way, understood this. When Washington died in December 1799, Hamilton wrote to a close acquaintance that Washington was uh, an aegis, a shield, very essential to him. He knew that Washington was the man who had protected him, who had made him what he was, who had given him such influence in the face of some real harsh criticism from his fellow Virginians, uh, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. So. Before we uh, thank Professor Knott, and I add, he was too modest, you know, the, uh, the Hamilton, the musical, is based on a book by Ron Chernow primarily. Ron Chernow based his book in part on Professor Knott. Uh, is there, am I right in understanding that the producers invited you to be there opening night? They did. Yeah. Yeah. So, the only uh, problem was I didn't think of a hip-hop musical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, My one major career. <laughs> yeah. uh, do, do us and the dining hall staff a favor. If you can bring your, your plates and rubbish over towards the corner, that there's just one person that's going to clean up after all of us, and we don't want her to be here all afternoon. So please help her out. And uh, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Stephen.